Good morning, church. Praise team, thank you for leading us in time of worship. That song at the end, man, he is arisen and he is alive. I hope you've had an incredible, incredibly, incredibly hateful week this week. Now, if you weren't here last week, that would be really an awkward statement. Why did my pastor hope, hope I had a hateful week last week? We were challenged last week in this focus series that part of our love towards Jesus Christ was remembering the suffering of what he went through, and therefore we would hate the sin that would keep us being blind, and that would keep us from fellowship, that would continue to sabotage us in this relationship. And so I hope you had a hateful week this week. I hope the Holy Spirit revealed to you some places of, uh, of disobedience and sin, and you put those things to death. You know, one of the things that we sometimes don't realize that in our church culture, we have a hard time with this idea of, of violence. And, and I'm not advocating that everything should be violent in the Christian life because we have this promise of peace, of living with God. But the attitude and behavior in which we should behave because we are redeemed by Jesus Christ should be hating sin, abhorring it completely. And so I hope you had a hateful week this week. I hope it was a good one, <laughs> but I hope it was hateful. Hopefully you, what you said and sensed was, as those things were put to death, as you had the ability from the Holy Spirit, the power to put those things away, you pleaded the blood of Jesus Christ in those moments of temptation, you walked away and you were praising God for what he had done. That it is possible for us to walk in this relationship because of what God has done through Jesus Christ and by the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, here's a, a hard thing. In this focus series, what we have said is, is that Jesus is the center of all Scripture. And sometimes that's hard for us because academically, that's not how we've looked at it. We, you know, we've gone through, you know, as a little kid, we looked at scripture. We've done that in middle school and high school. And you had some, some great teachers and some great maybe youth pastors and children's pastors. Um, and then you, you kind of went into your college years and you walked away from church maybe. You know, there was that season where there was no teaching. There was no influence. And as you walk back into your relationship, there's been some, some difficulty of stepping away from me as the center of, of the scripture, right? He did everything for me. I'm his focus to coming to the terms in this series of realizing Jesus is in all of this. And sometimes that's easy to see. Isaiah 53, Genesis 3. You know, in the, in the beginning when he created man, he said, let us create him in, in our image. And that word, Elohim, is, is a singular term referring to a plurality, a, a, a relationship of, of multiple things there together. And sometimes we struggle with that, right? In the beginning, in the very creation of the earth, Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit were all dwelling together. But I have to back away that I'm, I'm not the center of this because if he was there before time began and he's going to be there throughout all eternity, then why would I be the center of this? Because I am a finite being that will struggle that without Jesus Christ, my time here is going to end. But his time doesn't. But here's the, here's the crazy thing. If we push more into a person's story, what normally happens is we find things we don't like. For instance, when I was a child growing up, and my dad was, was the tallest man I knew. He was the biggest dude I knew. He was the strongest one I knew. He was the smartest person on creation. And I, I admired and adored my father. And whatever he did was right. How he spoke and the things, that, you know, the cars that he bought and, and the businesses that he did and all the things, the houses that he, everything he did was, was the right thing to do. And I wanted to be like my dad. So my dad wore boots, I wore boots. My dad was a UT fan. I was a UT fan. And that's University of Texas, not Tennessee. We don't acknowledge that that far east. Sorry, if you're a Tennessee fan, don't take that personal. But then I got into my middle school years, and there was this moment where my dad used a word, and I thought he was an absolute idiot because he said salmon. So obviously, if he says the word salmon, and there's an L in that word, and my dad's an idiot, therefore he's saying it incorrectly, because he said a lot of things incorrectly. He couldn't pronounce K's. He would say, go sit at your desk. It's like, Dad, it's not a D-E-S-T. It's a D-E-S-K. Can you say, well, you know what I'm talking. You get really upset about that stuff. So if my dad, who isn't well-educated, he left school in ninth grade, if he, he had a cheat to get his GD, so he had poor education, if he doesn't know a whole lot, and I'm a middle schooler, I know everything, therefore it should be Salmon, because my dad says it's Salmon, and he's an idiot. Who turned out to be the idiot? Me. 
But my father was flawed. He had a lot of, a lot of things in his personality that were not good. And so I went from being idolizing him to, to like completely destroying him every chance I got to, you know, you don't know, you don't understand. We would have arguments, and, and here I am, a high schooler. My high school education is beyond your comprehension. How arrogant is that for a high school kid? And then as I got into young adult, I became a father, I began to realize the balance of the good and the bad. A couple of weeks ago, I, I had a moment of heartache because one of the men who are in our culture who has spoken to my life and given me some ways to handle cultural truths and coming at that from a scriptural standpoint is a guy named Ravi Zacharias. And so I had a, a conversation with a couple. I said, hey, this guy can, can put these things about how the world began. He can, this apologetics idea, he can kind of look at the cultural terms and put it some vocabulary to it that can help you have conversations. And two days later, as I'm looking up these things to send some information to this couple, it turns out that, you know, after Ravi Zacharias had died, they began to pull back some of the veneer of who he was, and he was a very flawed person. Abusing people, abusing power, he was unchecked. He did not belong to a church that he would submit to authority under. The people who were in his organization did not have authority over his life, and he did things that were contrary to the values that he had set up and the things that he would talk about. Well, guess what? Human beings. But the hard part is the more we seem to dive into his life, it seems like the darker and uglier it becomes. And I began to kind of just shake my head and, and think, man, Ravi, you have sacrificed so much because of what you did personally. Now, Ravi's not talking back to me, so don't think I'm going crazy about this. But God revealed to me, guess what? If this church were to pull back the veneer of my life, guess what? It's a little bit darker than you would like to admit, me and you. And if any one of us were put under a microscope where every aspect, everything you ever said, and everything you do, and, and the way you treat people, and the thoughts you have about other people, then all of a sudden that ugliness would begin to show. The more we press into the story of people, the darker it becomes. And it doesn't matter if you're a historical person, right? George Washington, guess what? He didn't chop down a cherry tree and didn't tattle on himself. He wasn't that honest. Actually, he struggled with honesty throughout his life. And God may have had his hand on him, but he was not an anointed high priest. He wasn't a prophet. But if we start to dig away, pull back some of the things, we'll notice that there is some ugliness in George Washington's life. I watched a, a, a podcast where there were three African-American pastors at different stages of their life, and they were dealing with the person of Jonathan Edwards, the great preacher during the Great Awakening. And they were at different parts of the spectrum in dealing with who Jonathan Edwards was. And I'm not necessarily him as a person, but his theology. and Because it influences a lot of young preachers, and I'm one of them. And so this young guy's over here, and he's talking about, you know, Jonathan Edwards, his, his talk about the Holy Spirit, his work on preaching, his work on the church, talking about Jesus Christ. All these things are really solid. But then I discovered something, and the next guy up had been in ministry for about 10 years. He says, yeah, you know what, I was at that point as a younger preacher, but what I came to find out was that in his work in the Great Awakening, he was so busy that he couldn't help his wife manage the household, and so he bought a slave. When I realized this man who I admired, and this is the, the, the middle guy, the middle pastor speaking, when I realized that he had bought a human being, then I threw him completely out of my, my reading. I threw him completely out of my thinking. He was a flawed person that had done something indespicable, and I did not want to be a part of him whatsoever. And then the older pastor who's been in, in ministry for 30 years says, I've been in both places. That Jonathan Edwards was a hero for me. He was also the great antagonist. But I've come to realize that the writings that God gave him were incredible. And he was a flawed person. I cannot justify what he did. But I also can't walk away from some of the things that God revealed to him in the truth of his word. But what if it's different for Jesus Christ? What if the more we pull back, there isn't a veneer? What if the person who's probably, in, in, in my opinion, I would say academically, been tested more than any single a person in the history of, of humankind since he has been alive, died, resurrected, and, and descended to heaven, no one's life has been pulled apart more than Jesus Christ has. 
And the more we pull apart, is it possible that there's not an ugly truth that lies beneath that pulling? That he was never married to a woman. He never had an illegitimate kid. He never cheated on his taxes. (laughs) He never disrespected a person because he was perfect in what he knew about them. And the more we dive into who Jesus Christ is, the more we learn that it's beautiful. It doesn't mean it's easy. I had a, a former student of mine profess that Jesus Christ was a, a, a pacifist, and that's a lie. And they said, well, Jesus Christ talks about the love of God. Yeah, but this is the same man who also grabbed a whip, cleaning out the temple grounds, flipping over tables and whipping people. Get out of the, this place. You've made this into a den of thieves. So to say that he's a pacifist is incorrect. This is the same man who said, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. This is the same man who healed a man's ear when Peter pulled the sword out and lopped his ear off. But this is the same man who said, as you leave from here, sell what you have and buy a sword. So there's no deep, dark secrets that all of a sudden somebody's going to come across some scroll that says the true life of Jesus Christ tonight at 7 (laughs) o'clock. It's not going to happen. Because what will happen is if we discover more writings and more things that are truthful that we can verify, what we'll find is more truthfulness that is beautiful. The more we dig in, the more beautiful he becomes. I want to go back to some, some readings that, that Philip did like, um, when we first started this series. And this is out of Luke 24. And I just want to highlight something. And I've been grateful that over the last two weeks, we've had some really incredible preaching. And it's been very impactful preaching that we've had to deal with some very difficult things. Okay, but this morning, what I want us to focus on is, is on a different aspect of Jesus Christ and this complete idea that he is the center and the focus of all Scripture. When Philip went through Luke 24, he read this in verse 26. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things? And this is what Logan preached on last week. But then he finishes that up by saying, and enter into his glory. There's a complete picture that that Jesus is giving about himself on this road to Emmaus. He's kind of talking in third person, but but he's talking about himself. And and so we know that Jesus had to suffer in order to get to this place of glory. And this morning, I want to focus on this. So if you have your scriptures, I want to encourage you to open up to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11. Now let me tell you what's going to happen. We're going to go through this Philippians 2 verse. And I'm going to break this thing down. There's three key components here. But then my teaching points are going are to kind of leapfrog from there into some Old Testament, New Testament, and apocalyptic scriptures. Apocalyptic scriptures, there's several of those things in all of scripture, but you know, we'll look particularly at Revelation. But I want you to listen to this, that as, as we have studied and wrestled with the suffering that Jesus Christ had to go through, it was by his choice. But we also know that there was a glory that came out of this. And, and I will tell you, it's going to be difficult for me to explain this because there are terms that Paul will use that are very confusing to what true theology teaches. It's not that he's in contradiction. It's just that I don't know if I fully comprehend it yet. So I'm going to do the best I can to, to unpack that some so we can walk away from this. But I need you to be patient and gracious with me. As much as I may know and have studied this word, I've been a Christian for, for 39 years. And as much as I may know and God has granted me the ability to read and understand it as I've studied, I am still learning and I'm still studying as a student. So I'm going to do the best I can. And what I ask you to do is as we go through this, ask the Holy Spirit to open your heart and mind up that you may also understand. And maybe we can fellowship on that understanding together. Philippians chapter 2. Paul is talking to this incredible church in Philippi. They're doing some great things. But he has some things he wants to give them that take them into this relationship and and open their hearts and minds up to a depth that maybe they hadn't comprehended. And so he begins to talk about Jesus Christ and and his example of humility. And so beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2, this is what Paul writes. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy... Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then in verse 5, 
Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Will you pray with me? Then we're going to jump into this passage. Father, I pray this next moment, give us wisdom here. We need the Holy Spirit to help us to unpack and, and make sense of this. And so, Father, this next moment as we study Jesus Christ and him glorified, I pray that you would help us to understand and apply it and live according to it. Thank you that the Holy Spirit gives us that inside information. Father, thank you the fact that in this next moment as we peel back into some deeper things that we will find more and more beautiful things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to look back at, at verse 6. See, there's this thing that Jesus did. It was an act of humility and, and condescension. Now, let me just say this. We think of con condescending to someone as we're speaking down to their level, right? Um, I, I, I'm a kind of a prideful person. When somebody treats me like I'm a first grader, that really sets the fires inside my soul. Now, I don't know if you're like that, right? But, but somebody talks to me like I'm a little kid. Now, there are times when I will ask you, hey, this is a really difficult concept, so teach me like I'm a one-year-old. Teach me like I'm five, right? Speak to me that way. I want you to use simple terms. But when someone does that because they think I'm less than intelligent, man, don't, are you like that? But when it says that Jesus condescended, it doesn't mean that he simply patronized us, but he came and, and revealed himself in a way that we could understand, Though he was in the form of God, did not, account, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. In this understanding of the glory of Jesus, let me just clarify. Jesus did not take off the clothing of deity and set it to the side and step into earth as a, a, only a human being. We heard that last week, right? Do you guys remember the name of that term of studying the, the full being of Jesus Christ, the hypostatic union? Some of you walked away and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. but if he's truly God and truly man, then, then what does Paul mean in this that he, he emptied himself? He did not count equality with God, something to be grasped. What does it mean? Is that in this moment of humility, he could have used his deity to cancel out what was about to happen to him. He is Jesus Christ. He commands the host, which is the great army of angels. And at any moment, he could have said, stop, done with this. And not even like feats of strength and breaking chains, like the chains just disappear. And the angels appear, and they walk over and begin to slay the humans who are fighting at odds with God and who are rebellious. And he could easily have stepped back and said, you know what? Hey, you need to step off my throne and stepped into the place of court and stepped into the place of honor. He could have done it. It would have been no issue for him. At any point in time, he could have called in that army. But when Paul writes the fact that he emptied himself, it wasn't that he let his deity go to walk on earth. It was that he did not use his deity to his advantage that would cause him to become disobedient. As God and as man, he put himself through that willingly. And that's the beauty of what we heard last week. But here's the thing. He continues on, Paul does, and says in, in verse 9, In accordance with that action of humility, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Paul writes in Colossians something similar, that before time began, he was there and there was a purpose to his being there. But then in verse 10, Paul writes, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. God's act to glorify Jesus in connection with Jesus' humility was a powerful thing. You see, here's the thing, is that towards this humility and obedience, he highly exalted him. 
God said, here is my son who went through this process willingly to redeem humankind. Therefore, I'm going to put him in a place. Now, there's all kinds of references to that. Moses is walking the desert. We had this in the earlier readings in the series. But, but what happens is that these snakes come out and start biting people. And God says, if you'll put a snake on a stick and lift it up, everybody who's bitten with poison looks to the stick will be healed. And Jesus says, guess what? That was an image of me to come. That I must be glorified in such a way and lifted up that anyone who places their eyes on me would receive something incredible, a healing. And so his humility put him in a place of being exalted. Now, here's the issue I want you to understand. It's not that Jesus ever lost his sovereignty. It's not that in becoming a human that he ever lost his reign over all of creation. He was never disregarded by God. <laughs> he was never a, you know, taken to a place where he lost his name. But in this moment of obedience, when he is lifted up, we begin to understand. There is no place, no way, no form, no power that my acknowledgement of Jesus Christ ever gave him anything. I'm not the one who puts him on the throne. I'm not the one who says how great he is and therefore he is great. I'm not the one he looks to and says, hey, Kevin, am I, am I doing an okay job here? Yeah, two thumbs up, Jesus. You, you're rocking it. Keep going. I don't have to pat him on the shoulder for affirmation. What happened was is that in this moment of humility and then being lifted up by his father, I begin to understand. His sovereignty has made sense to me. It isn't reestablished. It isn't retaken. This isn't some kind of coup. He never lost authority. And I want you to understand that he didn't take it to his advantage and never did he lose it. But what he did was to bring salvation. And in lifting him up, all who would believe are then ushered into this relationship. You see, in verse 11, as it finishes out, Paul makes one incredible statement. That all of this that took place was not just for the glory of Jesus Christ, but God was actually glorifying himself. Now, don't think these are two different things. Because here's the thing. In his great work to, to, uh, through Jesus Christ, he drew mankind to himself. And so, therefore, through salvation, he is putting himself out there saying mankind can be saved. So Jesus is elevated, God is elevated, glorified, and therefore mankind is drawn. It's for salvation. But also the other thing that happens is, is that in, in elevating Jesus Christ and glorifying him, he glorifies himself and sovereignty is established. And that can be a confusing concept, but just know this, that by glorifying Jesus Christ, the one person that we all need relationship with is with God our Father. Jesus is the gateway to that relationship. The Holy Spirit reveals the need and the path of that relationship. And to say that any of those are diminished in any way is heresy. You are speaking a lie. There is a, a philosophy out there that says it really is all about Jesus Christ now. Jesus Christ is the only one we really should focus on. It's called the Jesus-only doctrine, and it is a straight lie because it negates the Father and negates the work of the Holy Spirit. And what we understand in Scripture is that all three of those exist together. They've been there before time, and they will continue on throughout eternity. And so in elevating Jesus Christ, God elevates himself because we are the ones he wants to have a relationship with. He says, come live in peace with me. So what we see is Paul saying, look, he, he, he did something that made sense to us, that there was a moment of humility that then brought this, this elevation and glorification, but it was all that God would be glorified. But I want you to see that in this process of salvation and sovereignty, that this wasn't the first time that the glory of Jesus Christ was spoken about. The Old Testament establishes the glory of Jesus Christ. Remember, he never lost it. He never, he never actually set it down. He didn't say, I'm going to take my crown off, and I'm not going to be God for a while. I'm just going to be a human being. He didn't do that. But the problem is, is that we didn't fully understand it. Mankind living before the birth of Jesus didn't understand that Jesus was in a place of honor. 
And so God spoke it and revealed it through all of Scripture. We look back in, in this idea of the timeless glory of Jesus Christ. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Daniel's having a vision. And in this vision, he comes to this place and, and he starts talking about this, this guy called the Son of Man and how in the ancients of days be presented before him. And then it says in verse 14, and to him, being the Son of Man, given glory and dominion and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. And so Daniel, in having his visions, didn't put the name Jesus to it, but he revealed the Messiah that would come, and Jesus Christ was being talked about. And it's a timeless kingdom that cannot be destroyed or overthrown. His, his glory, not only is timeless, but it's also universal. Isaiah 45, 23, and by myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. It doesn't say a certain tongue. It doesn't say a certain language. It is a universal concept that when he returns, guess what? Everybody's going to acknowledge it. As his children, we acknowledge with joy. I've been waiting to see you. You know, when we take communion, that's, that's part of what we're doing. So we're proclaiming the death of Jesus Christ and his return to come someday. And when that day comes and everybody's bowing down, everybody's confessing, everybody's singing these praises, we get to do it with joy. But we all know some people that if they don't profess faith in Jesus Christ, it will be sheer terror for them. But it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your religion is, your philosophy are, and who you know, your inside guy, the man that's got some connections. It doesn't matter. Everybody is going to make this profession of truth. It may not be in faith. It may not be in celebration. But it's going to happen. We also see that not only was his glory established through the Old Testament, we also see his glory revealed throughout the New Testament writers. The glory of Christ on display John 17, this is the high priestly prayer, and Jesus is praying in the garden, and he has this conversation, and he prays in the immediate moment, he prays for the next few moments, and he prays throughout all of time for human beings. But he says in verses 1 through 5, Jesus says this, when he had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said this, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. So it's a really great relationship, right? You glorify Jesus, you're going to glorify the, God, the father also. In verse 2, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all who you have given him, and this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Did you hear what Jesus said? Father, glorify me so that more may be drawn to you. And this is the glory that I have had from the very beginning of uh, always. There's, I can't go back and even say there's a beginning when this happened because he's timeless. Right? We already said that. But Jesus in this prayer talks about his glorification and what it does with him and the Father. We know that also in the New Testament, in the, in the, the gospel writers and what Paul wrote, he wrote that the, God, the glory of Christ brought peace. Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes this in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that is in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. That is our Jesus Christ. He didn't sit here and say, you guys are a bunch of losers. I'm done with you. What he actually did was to say, you're a bunch of losers, but I'm coming to help you. <laughs> I'm going to bring some peace. You're at odds. For a person who lives in, in contesting relationship with their father is a person who is at chaos and, and at odds within themselves and odds with the person who created them. 
And the way it often reveals itself is much like me as an ignorant little kid. I know more. I would never do this. Therefore, I can't ever see God doing this. And I don't understand the why of what was done and the authority by which it was done with. And so I begin to judge God based on my own understanding. And that is a flawed place to be. I'm at odds. I'm trying to figure out how to resolve this tension. And I've resolved this death sentence upon me. And I can't get rid of it. And Jesus says, peacemaker, I got you. And he did it. He did it perfectly. He revealed. He spoke. And and then God revealed it through other writings that he was the one to come. And it brought him glory. And then finally we see this. That his glory was exalted. It was established. It was revealed. And then it was exalted. Revelations chapter 5. I want you to, to listen. This is really, really difficult thing, stuff, but, but I think the Holy Spirit's going to let us understand some things here. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 5 of Revelation, Then I saw at the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Now I'm going to stop there. There's a moment of expressed hopelessness and concern. There is something here that the angel cannot do. There is something here that the angel is expressing a concern. Can it even happen? And what he's actually doing is he's setting the stage that no one else has the authority or the ability to read what's inside the scroll. It is captured against them. And then, in verse 3, no one, no one in heaven and on earth or under the earth is able to open the scroll or to look into it. What did we just say about the name of Jesus? Where was he going to be proclaimed? It sounded very similar to that. Verse 4, and I began to weep. This is John who's writing this, right? He's having this apocalyptic moment. It says, I began to weep loudly because there was no one found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And so the, the expressed hopelessness of the angel becomes the embodiment of hopelessness in John, a human being. He was an apostle. He was set apart for God's work, but he was hopeless in this moment. Mankind is doomed. There is a word that's been spoken that we cannot hear, and it's going to set us into a place of chaos. And he weeps. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Let me just say, remind you once again, when he says the elders, he's talking about those who, you know, some some specific people, that's a whole other study, but just know this, that the term elder in its most literal translation means bearded one. So beards exist in heaven. Let me go on. (laughs) The elder said to me, weep no more. Behold, there's hope. Behold, The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Hope has been revealed. We are weeping, and Jesus Christ has then revealed the only hope of humankind. And it takes the tears away and brings a moment of joy. He is the only one who has the ability to do that. And it's because his father elevated him to a place of glory through his humility, leaving his station in heaven to walk among mankind, to feel the pain of mankind, to show for us what it was to walk with God as a human being. And in this moment now, the great hope was revealed. He has the ability to speak hope into all existence. And then he continues on in verse 9. That the The outcome of this is a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and a priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures, the elders, and the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is them saying, To him who sits on the throne, 
And to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said in unison, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Is that your response? That Jesus revealed in his great glory that you would not say, Oh my God, but you would say, Praise. This is the one, and I'm the one that he bought, and I live in that relationship. Praise God for this. Hallelujah. Amen. Put a cap on it. We're walking into an eternity perfectly before our God, worshiping without separation. Amen. Amen? Can I say that term? It is said. Say it with me. Jesus Christ is Lord. And if that is true for you, then you should also say amen. So here's the truth now. In his glory, set up forever, he is glorified. Now, I feel kind of insignificant to this because it doesn't matter if I acknowledge it or not. Not to his glory, it doesn't. But every moment that I live in obedience, he is honored and glorified through me. I don't place him on the throne, I just acknowledge he's there. Every moment of hatefulness against sin and striving as hard as I can with, with sweats like him, with drops like blood, that I want to put sin to death, my disregard of another human being, my disobedience to give, my disobedience to use my gifts and talents, my selfishness to protect myself, the idea that I would, would, would want to be the God who would do all things because I'm perfect in my knowledge, my wanting to steal from the church and steal from other people and steal from my business, for me to, to be elevated to a place that's not truthful, for me to speak untruthfulness about who he is, <sighs> it's a dangerous place to be. And yet he continues over and over again to redeem me, to give me forgiveness. And I struggle to not simply live there in shame, but to put those things to death because when I do, it glorifies him. When I choose to walk with a brother or sister who's in pain, it glorifies him. When I pray for a brother and sister who have lost hope, I glorify him. When I allow someone to walk with me and carry some of these burdens that we've got, it glorifies him. When I put myself in a place of humility and I wash someone's feet, figuratively or literally, whatever it is for you, I glorify him. The more that I reduce myself to a place of submission, the more it glorifies him. And I would tell you, lose your strength to stand on your own. Relinquish your ability to be independent from needing him. Because the more we need, the more we glorify. The more we celebrate, the more we glorify. We've heard in the last few weeks that in the, the idea that Jesus was, was then brought to a place of execution, that there was a place of grotesqueness that took place. And what we saw that in Scripture, Jesus, the glory of Jesus was then thread throughout everything. Isaiah 45 then speaks into Luke 19, which then speaks into John 17, which then is revealed in, John, in Revelation chapter 5. He is in all of it. But our response determines if we recognize that glory or if we try to diminish it. And I would tell you, brothers and sisters, that at Jesus' execution, we find his exaltation. And I want to respond as one of his followers. I want to respond and likewise, just like he was obedient to the Father, let me be obedient also. We've had this a couple of weeks now. But in that passage in Luke 24, one of the really key functional parts of that was what? When their hearts burned within them. They looked back and said, you know what? He was talking about the Messiah and did our hearts burn within us. And I pray the last few weeks you've had that heart burn. Logan said, it's not the one that alleviates with Tums. This is better than any Mexican food or Cajun food or anything spicy you might eat. If you're lactose intolerant, this isn't what we're talking about. But it's a burning to realize that the Savior of the world has redeemed me. That the God of the world is my Father. And the Holy Spirit that transforms me to become like Him is my great advocate. So let our hearts burn this morning to glorify Jesus. How do we do that? We respond in glory now. You see, like, Paul, like, like Philip said, he, he reveals himself to us. That's the beauty of Scripture. 
Is it just like those guys going to Emmaus? He continues to reveal himself to us, and the Holy Spirit begins to open our eyes and continues to work in us to understand it, and then we, we adopt it, we apply it, we, we live according to it. I've had a couple of conversations in the last few weeks with, with counselors, and, and praise God, I've had some really good conversations with some really good Christian counselors. The Word will tell you it's okay the way you are, it is not a bad thing the way you are, you just need to come to terms with it. And it makes us feel better about our brokenness. It allows us to deflect that brokenness onto other people. You caused this. It's not my fault I'm this way. It's your fault. But our Christians and brothers and sisters who are into counseling realize that when the Holy Spirit reveals the brokenness, we have to change. We don't stay the way we are. I don't get ushered into the kingdom with the dirty clothes and filthy rags. I get ushered in in new clothes because the Holy Spirit has revealed that I was dirty, I was broken, I was separated, but I need to become more like Jesus Christ. And that may be a heavy weight for you, but the Holy Spirit says, I'll walk with you in this. I'll work it into you. And so slowly he begins to present us with beautiful, clean clothes, a new creation, a new heart, new clothing, a new mind, refreshed to be like Jesus Christ. So Paul wrote in Philippians 2, to have the mind of Christ takes the work of the Holy Spirit. We have to change. We have to be transformed. It doesn't work any other way. And so thank God he reveals himself so we know what that looks like. Number two, we want to love him genuinely. That's what we heard last week from Logan. And one of the ways we love is to hate. I know it sounds counterintuitive. Spend some more time. Watch that sermon another three or four times before you start to really make sense of this. But we must respond in genuine love. And then today I want you to understand that we glorify him when, listen to this, very words of Jesus, when we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and all of our strength, with every desire, with every emotion, with every thought that flows out into every action. Jesus should be on our minds constantly. If you can't wait to get out of this building so you can move on to lunch, patience, because Jesus is waiting for you at lunch also. And some of you are thinking, I don't want to leave this place because I've got to go back to that workspace that I hate. It's so dark. Guess what? Jesus is waiting for you at your workplace. Because God exists in all places, the way that we glorify him is we think about him every day, all the time, constantly. And that may seem a little profane in some ways. When I'm disciplining my children, am I glorifying God through that? When I don't discipline my kids, am I, am I glorifying God in that? When I treat my wife or my husband with a sense that they don't really understand, I kind of diminish them, am I glorifying Christ? Or when I speak to them with the truthfulness because I see the image of God and I'm grateful for the partnership, and, and although sometimes it's not perfect, because if I've got to be transformed, they must also be transformed. The work of Jesus Christ helps us to live in this relationship, and the Spirit working on us helps us to keep this union together, and that work begins to proclaim Jesus Christ in all the world through your marriage. The way I treat my employees, the way I treat my employer, the way I take care of my finances, the way I don't take care of my finances, in every aspect of who we are, our heart, our soul, our mind, and strength, may we learn to glorify Jesus Christ. Some of you walk out of here. Sometimes I walk out of here. And something engages me that I become very fleshly driven. I want to control. I want to punish. I want to have retribution. I want to be justified. And I have to go back and say, where are you in this moment? And how is it that the Holy Spirit is working Jesus through me in this moment? And how can these thoughts and these actions glorify Jesus Christ in this moment? And just asking the question, striving for obedience, and recognizing when it happens, is glorifying Jesus Christ. So you're sent out today. And I want you to realize that the more we do this, 
thing of glorifying him every day, every moment with every person, even if they are the worst person on the face of the earth. If I understand and seek God in those moments, I'm still lifting Jesus Christ up high. And when that happens, it changes the people around us. Now, let me just say this. If I live out this life and I grow in this glorification, am I going to save anybody? No. But God in his mystery has chosen to include me in his work of redemption. And in glorifying Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has a moment that may break through their resistance and open their fleshly mind and say, you need this. And if I get to be a part of that, I glorify God. So I'm going to encourage you today. In all that you do, because he has revealed himself, has shown us how to do great love in great ways, that we now have a chance to glorify him incredibly. And let's do that together as the church. Will you pray with me? Father, as we spend this moment in prayer, I ask that you would deal with us. Sometimes it's hard because there's a a part of our our selfishness that still exists. We haven't put it to death yet. There's that sin that continues to kind of take a a pet place in our life. We, We talk bad about it, but we keep it close by. Father, there are moments when I disregard that Jesus exists and that you are present in places and that the Holy Spirit is working. When I do that, I diminish Jesus Christ. I don't glorify him, and you've called me to do that. And so, Father, deal with us as a church. And I pray that not just one particular person would be faithful. It wouldn't be just one small group that does this really well. It wouldn't be just the staff or, or those sacred volunteers who work in the, behind the scenes. And maybe it wouldn't be the, the, the elders and the older, the older parts of our congregation. It wouldn't be the new people with new ideas. It wouldn't be just a segment. But, Father, that you would work this into us as a congregation, that we together as individuals and as a body would glorify Jesus Christ. And if nothing else happens, we will find the joy of living in obedience. But what I have read in Scripture is that when Jesus Christ is lifted high, it changes people. And so, Father, we ask that you teach us to do that. And so in this next moment, deal with us. That we may honor, glorify, and live in obedience. We pray these things in Jesus' name.